Michael, row your boat ashore. Alleluia. Michael, row your boat ashore. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are continuing our reading in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And if you're unfamiliar what we're doing on these live streams, I suggest you start from the beginning and make the eight-hour sacrifice to get through this entire series. Uh, I'm only half-joking. I actually think it's some of the most valuable work I've ever done. So we'll see. We'll see how it bears itself out through time. But the reason we're reading passages from Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance is we're trying to figure out what makes a quality game. And better than anything I've ever read, this book attempts to tackle the mystery called quality. What makes some things qualitatively, unmeasurably, and yet still definitively better than others? So we are continuing our reading starting on page 217 of my copy. I was talking about the first wave of crystallization outside of rhetoric that resulted from Phaedrus's refusal to define quality. He had to answer the question, if you can't define it, what makes you think that quality exists? And his answer was an old one, belonging to a philosophic school that called itself realism. A thing exists, he said, if a world without it can't function normally. If we can show that a world without quality functions abnormally, then we have shown that quality exists, whether it's defined or not. He thereupon proceeded to subtract quality from a description of the world as we know it. The first casualty from such a subtraction, he said, would be the fine arts. If you can't distinguish between good and bad in the arts, they disappear. There's no point in hanging a painting on the wall when the bare wall looks just as good. There's no point to symphonies when scratches from the record or hum from the record player sound just as good. Poetry would disappear, since it seldom makes sense and has no practical value. That word practical is, that's an interesting one. What's practical and what's not? Maybe we'll get into that. And interestingly, comedy would vanish too. No one would understand the joke since the difference between humor and no humor is pure quality. Next, he would make sports disappear. Football, baseball, games of every sort would vanish. The scores would no longer be a measurement of anything meaningful, but simply empty statistics like the number of stones in a pile of gravel. Who would attend them? Who would pay for the sports games? Next, he subtracted quality from the marketplace and predicted the changes that would take place. Since quality of flavor would be meaningless, supermarkets would carry only basic grains such as rice, cornmeal, soybeans, and flour, possibly also some upgraded meat, milk for weaning infants, and vitamin and mineral supplements to make up for deficiencies. Alcoholic beverages, tea, coffee, and tobacco would vanish. So would movies, dances, plays, and parties. We would all use public transportation. We would all wear GI shoes. A huge proportion of us would be out of work, but this would probably be temporary until we relocated in essential non-quality work. Applied science and technology would be drastically changed, but pure science, mathematics, philosophy, and particularly logic would be unchanged. And Phaedrus found this last to be extremely interesting. The purely intellectual pursuits were the least affected by the subtraction of quality. If quality were dropped, only rationality would remain unchanged. That was odd. Why would that be? He didn't know. But he did know that by subtracting quality from a picture of the world as we know it, he'd revealed a magnitude of importance of this term he hadn't known was there. The world can function without it, without quality, but life would be so dull as to be hardly worth living. In fact, it wouldn't even be worth living. The term worth is a quality term. Life would just be living without any values or without any purpose whatsoever. He looked back over the distance this line of thought had taken him and decided he'd certainly proved his point. Since the world obviously doesn't function normally when quality is subtracted, quality exists, whether it's defined or not. After conjuring up this vision of a qualityless world, he was soon attracted to its resemblance to a number of social situations he had already read about. Ancient Sparta came to mind, communist Russia in her satellites, 
Communist China, The Brave New World of Aldous Huxley, and The 1984 of George Orwell. He also remembered people from his own experience who would have endorsed this qualityless world, the same ones who tried to make him quit smoking. They wanted rational reasons for his smoking, and when he didn't have any rational reasons, they acted very superior, as though he'd lost face or something. They had to have reasons and plans and solutions to everything. They were his own kind, the kind he was now attacking. And he searched for a long time for a suitable name to sum up just what characterized them, so as to get a handle on this qualityless world. It was intellectual primarily, but it wasn't just intelligence that was fundamental. It was a certain basic attitude about the way the world was, a presumptive vision that it ran according to laws, reason, and that man's improvement lay chiefly through the discovery of these laws of reason and application of them towards satisfaction of his own desires. It was this faith that held everything together. He squinted at this vision of a qualityless world for a while, conjured up more details, thought about it, and then squinted some more and thought some more and then finally circled back to where he was before. Squareness. That's the look. That sums it. Squareness. When you subtract quality, you get squareness. Absence of quality is the essence of squareness. So for those of you my age and younger, you don't actually remember what being square means. But back in my day, we called it being uncool. So an absence of quality means everything is pretty lame. You know, everything's pretty much the same. Boring, stunted, gray, no color, no spice of life. And that's always useful when making a decision on anything or trying to figure out anything. Subtract it. Instead of trying to figure out what the thing is, like what the decision is going to do, you just subtract the thing and you think of what your world would be like without it. And then you stop taking it for granted. Good morning, everybody. I forgot how abruptly that ended. So if you're following these streams thus so far, you're probably wondering to yourself, why the heck is he spending so much time on quality? Uh, I get that quality is necessary in order to make a great game, but why this obsession? I mean, obviously, everybody knows that quality exists because some things are better than others. Uh, if you watched the last stream, I think I did a decent job answering that question, but really quick to summarize, we know quality exists because we recognize it. We can recognize it easily. We are receivers of quality, but that's a very different thing than the ability to produce quality from ourselves. And that's, that's why we're so focused on it. That's why we're so focused on it. Um, but I'll give you another reason why I'm talking about quality so much, because I think this understanding of quality, like a true understanding of quality, is not only the key to making a great game or a, or a great anything, but it's actually going to be the key to navigating and understanding what separates a human from the machine in the present age that we're in. And I wanted to connect this to AI because I'm going to I'm going to speculate a lot on this stream. I'm going to try to connect so many different things, so many different thoughts that have been rumbling around in my head. Um, and I'm probably going to do a poor, poor job in doing so. So I ask you to bear with me. But I think the AI example is going to be the best example of our present age, better than anything like 1984 or ancient Sparta. It's going to be the best example of our age to think about a world without quality. And the essence of quality is, when he said the essence of quality, or a world without quality is squareness, I think the essence of quality is, let's say, the enrichment of life, the, the things that make life worth living. And so that applies to games, but it also applies to, well, just about everything else. And hello, Ron. Yes, I've got my coffee. My 
uh, completely transparent coffee here. Here we go. So how, how do I drink that which is ghostly in form? Um, so let's talk about squareness to start. Let's go back to squareness. So what makes something lame square? That's a more common uh, way of thinking about it. So I had I had kind of two images in my mind uh, yesterday as I was thinking about this, as I was thinking about the essence of squareness. One was AI generated videos of Will Smith eating spaghetti. So about a year ago were the first AI generated videos. And I remember this video going viral of Will Smith eating spaghetti or the rock eating rocks. And it was hilarious. Like at the time, I, th I thought it was really funny. Um, or uh, I asked my daughter, she's about eight years old. And I said, um, do you know the song, the Harlem shake? And she's like, no. And when I, so I looked it up and the Harlem shake came out, I think like eight years ago, maybe 10 years ago, something like that. And I remember these things at the time, like the Will Smith eating spaghetti or the Harlem shake. And they were, they were so profound, like they were so, uh, I was going to say transform. They were not transformative. They took over the culture, right? Like they, they were like, people were just watching. Like it was, it was hilarious. Like AI generated videos, all this. And, and I compare that to something like in my own experience, uh, the game Deus Ex, which came out in the, the year 2000. It's about, it's going to be 25 years next year. Um, so, so you could compare two different cultural phenomena that happen roughly around uh, or not even roughly around the same time, but but have roughly the same kind of initial view count and impact uh, on the culture. And then you can look at those cultural phenomena and see how much they're talked about or discussed over time. And I'm sure you could do that through something like a Google search or the YouTube algorithm or anything like that. And I think this element of time, uh, like substance through time, is the key element of quality. And so I want to draw the distinction of quantity versus quality. So when, when we talk about quantity, we're talking about something that's measurable. We're talking about, okay, I've got this many views, I've got this many subscribers, this many, you know, whatever it might be, right? And I talk about, uh, that could be anything, that could be uh, money is quantity, right? But when you talk about quality, like how good something is, like uh, what's an example? Um, what's an example? So music, how good is this particular music? How good of a dancer is this particular thing? When we're talking about quality, we can only measure it in relation to other qualitative entities in the same category. So if you say this is how good this music is, you're always comparing it to another form of music or another song in the same genre. Or if you're, if you're saying like, wow, yeah, I've got this friend, he's a really good dancer. And then you have this other guy who, let, let's say your friend who you're talking to about the guy who's a really good dancer, you know another guy, both of you, who's a really good dancer. And he's like, oh yeah, yeah, he's better than that, that guy. Or he's, not, or he's almost as good as that guy. So you can only, we can only really talk about quality in relation to another qualitative phenomena, another qualitative entity, I would say. But it's not something that's down to earth measurable when you think about it. Um, and so I want to discuss uh, quality in relation to the relationship between art and quality. And so I'm going to throw out a few hypotheses. And then we're going to get into it. So here are my hypotheses. When we talk about quality in regard to great games, we're talking about great games as art. I think most people would agree that great games can be art. I've had a lot of discussions with uh, Noah President Foxman on this. Um, now, here's the next one. This is, this is the thing that I don't think many people think about. Uh, the thing that I don't think many people think about is that art is that which edifies. So what do I mean by edify? So art is that which points itself to something that's transcendent, something beyond just the art, something that is good, true, and beautiful. And I'm going to use those as objective terms. 
they don't it doesn't have to be all three good true and beautiful but it has to be at least one probably two <laughs> in order to be considered art um it has to at the very least it has to point to something beyond itself because if if you think about that gray qualityless world that the guy was talking about in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. In that world, so so imagine you couldn't receive quality. Like imagine you couldn't differentiate something between like this sound, like me knocking on my desk and a drum beat. Like imagine that you that it was all the same, that nothing was better than anything else. Um, and when I when I began to imagine that, I really started to realize that that's how AI perceives the world, um, or an AI doesn't even perceive really. But that's that's really the essence. The only difference between me knocking my desk multiple times and the AI uh, thinking that that's a drum beat is what we tell it is what, um, and. The, the pointing to something beyond, the something that's good and true and beautiful. Um, I wrote down that art is unexpected. Art is unexpected. And what is it that's unexpected in AI? That's, that's a question. Um, I, don't think, I don't think it has that category. I don't think it has the unknown unknown. Um, and I wrote down that good art causes awe. A-W-E. Like you ever walk into a beautiful cathedral or just I remember seeing the night sky for the very first time because I had grown up in the suburbs I'd never seen a really uh, truly uh, empty night sky or just you know no clouds is what I mean with with no city lights you know messing up the night sky and I was about 12 years old we were playing manhunt and boy scouts we ran out into the field and we were hiding we we're supposed to be hiding and um, and then I just stopped and I just stared up at the sky and all my friends were like uh hey we gotta we gotta hide what are you doing and i was like I, I don't care like this is just it was an involuntary response to beauty i'll put it that way so that's awe that's a-w-e awe um the thing that is beyond your present conception of what is good and true and beautiful the thing that's beyond that conception that hits you um uh, the Okay, so last axiom here. So the deeper the art, the longer in duration, the more profound the art has an impact on culture. So you could have two games and one is, and both games, let's say, are equally successful in the moment, like let's say only up, and let's say another game like Deus Ex, and one is remembered, one is not. So let me go back to that. The deeper the art, the longer the duration, the more profound the art has an impact on culture. Um, so art, something about art, something about quality is remembered. Uh, something about quality kind of imprints itself on our hearts. Um, and to go back to squareness for a moment. So squareness is the thing that we experience that's lame that we do not take into our hearts, right? So squareness is the thing that we're like, oh, that's, that's lame. It's uncool, whatever. We have no interest in having a relationship, having an association to the thing that is square, to the thing that, whereas the thing that's like really good, true art, whatever that is in our hearts, let's say, that we really want to have a relationship to. And squareness at the societal level is basically the removal of what I would call culture. Now, sorry, that was a, that was a long monologue. And this is what I wanted to talk about. And how this relates to game development. Um, I would say this relates to RPGs in obvious ways, but we're going to talk about this in relation to game development. And more importantly, we're going to talk about it in relation to navigating the present time, the present age, the present era, and what's coming with AI. Um, okay, so we talked about art as being a foundational element of culture. Or no, I didn't talk about that, but I, I'm, I'm alluding to that because we say that good games are art. Art is something that is unexpected. It causes awe. 
uh, so art has to be something that comes in from the outside. And so I drew this diagram yesterday. I had this mild epiphany. I'm, I'm really riffing on these things in real time or somewhat real time, I should say. So all of this I just put together yesterday. So pardon the, uh, the <laughs> low quality drawing here. But I labeled this the stable structure of culture, how cultures evolve and change over time. You could think about it that way. So what is a culture? Like, like, so if we say quality is that which, I gotta think about this. So if we say a world without quality is a world without culture, uh, that leads us to ask the question, okay, what, what is a culture? And I just put it here, like what society values What's it? Why is Chad calling me? He knows I'm streaming at this time. What society values, loves, elevates, celebrates. Uh, so that's the essence of a culture at the top. And you can think of this diagram in terms of at the very top, we have the highest uh, abstractions of each of these things. Like what by abstraction, I mean, it's most removed from physical reality. Uh, so you have the stuff that's kind of at the, the physical reality of each of these, and you have the things that are at the top, which are the most abstracted kind of uh, mathematics would be a good example. So transmission of ideas here. And the way I'm defining culture and that which is not culture as sort of the inside and outside dichotomy. Anyone who's within the TLC um, knows what I'm talking about. You, you have this heuristic down pat. You know exactly what I'm describing, where you have the, the inside and you have the outside. Um, and you could also, but you could also think about this at the individual level. And you can also think about this as, as the collective level. So last, uh, last uh, episode, we talked about the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. Um, so the nature here are what fall into the category of both the un the known unknowns and then the unknown unknowns. Okay, so it, within a culture, you have what society values, loves, elevates, celebrates. And you can think of it as like who society wants you to be. And you could think of also um, the different paths in a culture that each person can become a productive member of society, whatever that means. And you can think of, okay, why are certain paths when, within a culture more celebrated, more elevated, uh, like, why are those the paths or the the uh, values of, of a culture? And this is where, you know, people who are just uh, g game developers and not into the weird topics that I'm into are going to, I'm probably going to lose them. But at the base of a culture is the religious tradition of a culture. What do I mean by that? At the base of a culture is the religious tradition of a culture. All religion is at its core, <laughs> the essence of religion is, you could use the word sacred. What, what are the most sacred elements of a people? I don't care who you are. You could be Sam Harris, uh, four horsemen of, the new, of new atheism, uh, atheist. There is still something within your life that is the most uh, sacred. And so an example of that is you might say your family. Like I, I, I you know, if you talk to someone who says like, I would die for my family, you know, th there you go. You just hit on one of their most uh, sacred principles, uh, religious foundation of, of that person. And, but these are not just principles. Uh, most religions are our stories because stories are revel revelatory of who people are and what people value. That's what a story does. So you watch Star Wars or Harry Potter or something like that. And what happens through over the course of the story is you are bound to the characters that you really like or love. And you're bound to them through the experience that they go through and the choices that they make that reveal their character, reveal who they are. And, and the reason you're bound to those characters is because you see something in those characters, like an ideal. You see something that kind of calls out to you and says, like, I want to be like Aragorn, or I want to be like this or that, 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 or I really admire Sam from uh, Lord of the Rings or something like that. And all of those stories. So you could say, so something like Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones, um, you know, all those were stories that, that uh, I would say were pretty binding and edifying, like art for lack of a better word. Um, 
And those stories were binding people together through their love of the story and the characters. So they're not uh, inherently part of the religion of a culture, but they're that layer kind of above in the culture where they take the religious values of a culture and whether or not they outright say it. So this is the other thing. Most people will say like, Harry Potter is not religious, Lord of the Rings. Well, Tolkien is, uh, you know, Catholic, but uh, but J.K. Rowling, good example. It's like, she's not particularly religious, but it that's that's besides the point. It actually doesn't matter. And the reason it doesn't matter is because uh, all of the ideas that we have, right? So let's say J.K. Rowling would say, well, my biggest influences were Shakespeare and this and this and this and this. But then you could say, uh, okay, what are Shakespeare's biggest influences? And if you trace that back, um, all the influences, all the art, let's say, that influenced other artists, and you could think of it as like this edifice of art that gets built through time, right? You think of the, duh, 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 duh. you got, so you take your favorite uh, musical artist. So mine was Green Day, right? Back in, uh, back in the, back in my day, back in the uh, like early two thousands, I loved Green Day. American Idiot album, favorite album. Uh, like I, I felt like it told a beautiful story. At the time, I didn't even realize why it was my favorite, but it was like, it told a beautiful story. Jesus of Suburbia. Um, okay. But you take something like Green Day, an American Idiot album, and then you say like, okay, who were their influences? Like, who were the artists that influenced them? And then you go back to those artists, and then who were the artists that influenced them? And you go back to those artists, and da, 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 da. And, and, and if you trace that all the way back, you get down to this kind of stuff, the religious foundation of a culture. Um, okay. And then you have new art that comes into the culture that becomes part of the tradition of the culture. Like everyone for a long time was talking about Game of Thrones and everyone was disappointed with how Game of Thrones ended and da da da. It's that kind of thing. Okay. So we got our culture. Then we have nature. So, and last, uh, I think last live stream or a couple live streams ago, I talked about the divide between the left brain and the right brain. And a simple way of thinking about this is that which is understood, known, which could be culture over here at the individual level, uh, and that which is outside, not understood, not yet known, the known unknowns, and that's, that's nature. So this is, think of nature as the right brain of a people. Uh, oh, like I said, it could be the individual level, could be the level of the people, and culture is the left brain of the people. These are the things that are known, that are practiced, that are incorporated. And so this is where we start talking about AI and it gets really, really interesting in that you think of this as the totality of human experience. Like this entire diagram is the total sum or that's my goal is that it reflects the total sum. But if you think about AI, the AI only knows what's in this culture bucket. Now the AI might know some of this down here. So you might have an AI that's programmed for a specific purpose. Like let's say the Canadian AI, I'm kind of, I'm just making a silly joke here, but let's say Canada makes the ultimate AI and Canada says, our AI is gonna be Canadian and it's not gonna be American, it's gonna be Canadian. So there has to be some level of program programming there that says that the AI is not going to incorporate uh, for example, like certain American values that are distinctly not Canadian. <laughs> and the AI has to elevate, the AI has to say, these are the Canadian values that are the highest values in the Canadian culture. So you can program an AI to know about this down here, but it, it still has to, uh, so the, I guess the culture here could be sort of uh, a weirder shaped diagram here. Um, for, for the AI. So that would be a sort of like um, a known unknown. Like the AI says, I know about this, but this is not going to affect my programming because we want our AI to be Canadian and not American. That's a silly example. We kind of get where I'm going. Like you could have an AI that says like, we're aware of this other culture, but we don't believe in this or why or that, 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 anyway. But the part of the AI the, that the AI does not have is well it's all this it's all this stuff right here so in in really ancient terms you could think of uh shamans like shamans uh you could think of all the things that are epiphanies and experiences all the 
phenomenological stuff. And also just at the sociological level, you have the misfits and outcasts of a culture. That which the culture does not value, love, elevate, celebrate. And that's really where a lot of the artists, the true artists live. And the reason that I said that is, the reason I say that is because if you go back to what I was just talking about, that uh, this, the, the, the deeper the art, the longer in duration, the more profound the art has an impact in culture, um, it's that the true art is unexpected. The true art causes awe, A-W-E. And that's the prophets. And, and in order to be unexpected, this is the key. This is finally, I'm getting to the point. In order, in order, to, in order for art to be unexpected, in order for art to inspire awe, it has to be something that's initially outside of the culture. It has to be outside of the known. And then it then has to be incorporated in to culture. Um, and that's, that's this process. But the same goes for the scientific enterprise across the, across the world. All transmission of ideas. Um, and I, I arrange these from most abstract down to, well, the most physical. So trade, you know, physical objects, immigration, physical people. And then you have war, uh, which is probably the most physical way uh, that cultures get shared. Well, haven't you noticed we've been sharing our culture with you all morning? So there you go. Um, okay. And why am I talking about this in relation to quality? And that is because this over here is all the quality stuff that the AI cannot see. And this right here on the left, what society values, loves, elevates, celebrates, that is only able to be, that is only able to be measured by the AI or only able to be understood by the AI in relation to quantity. So who and what is saying or doing or expressing what a society values, loves, celebrates, and celebrates. That is what the AI is able to, to really understand. So the AI can say, can see that, oh, this term or this value or this da 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 is used far more often than this other thing. But the AI is inherently not going to see the value. The AI is not going to see the value of the misfits and the outcasts, whoever is regarded as persona non grata in a culture, even if they're right. And we have that conception in our stories. Our best stories have that conception, don't they? They have the conception of someone who's an outcast or a misfit in some way, shape or form. Like um, Fight Club is like, I, th I think of all the, 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 the masculine movies um, that talk about nihilism in the late 90s. So things like Fight Club, uh, American Beauty, The Matrix, great example. That's an example of these misfits and outcasts who are able to then identify something that becomes art. Um, and in, I would say, the Barbie movie is is an example of that um, more recently. It's almost like, uh, um, I've said this in other conversations, but that the feminine spirit of the age has sort of reached the same level as Fight Club and The Matrix, et cetera, of um, basically not knowing the value of the misfit or not knowing, <sighs> this is hard to put into words. Yes, I'll put it that way. It's, it's like we, we think that only that which is within culture is that which has value. And the problem is that the more that whatever's within culture gets separated from this, from what's down here, uh, the religious foundation of culture, the more it gets separated from that, then the more likely that one of two things is going to happen. Either there's something called a revival, which has happened mo multiple times in, in history. Very common. And a revival is the equivalent of saying, we messed up, we repent. We go back to our roots, we're rediscovering the ancient magic, the ancient wisdom, and we're reconnecting heaven and earth. 
Um, yeah, that's a good example. And in this case, heaven's coming from below, but you get the idea. Uh, or, or you have um, a break from the religious foundation of a culture. So an example of that is the Protestant Reformation 15, in the 1500s, where they say, well, we are you know, a more accurate reflection of the religious foundation of a culture. And, um, and, but there are like you know, less uh, sudden examples of that, where over the Roman Empire, the Roman em Empire got converted to Christianity over a large period of time. Uh, but, then, but then there was kind of a, a, a sudden switch that happened where the Roman Empire converted uh, under Constantine, or officially, officially. So that, that, that was like the foundation of enough people then got built into the tradition from uh, Constantine. So, mm. okay, what does this have to do with a great game? Oh, man. <clears throat> this is the part where I got to figure out how I'm feeding all this in. And let's get Unreal Engine up and running. While I'm booting up, quality as a concept makes zero sense unless there are players in the game unless there are some some uh, participants in a game. So what do I mean by that? So imagine that you're running a simulation. So okay, so, so imagine our whole existence universe as a simulation for a moment. And but actually, let, let's go back to a, a more clear example that happens every day um, today, which is uh, you have um, Universities, the Weather Channel, others—they're they're running uh, simulations of weather patterns. Okay, so they're running simulations of weather patterns. If you're running a simulation of weather patterns, are you going to build into that simulation? Are you going to build into that simulation um, how individual people are thinking about weather? So let, let me repeat that. So you're building a simulation to try to understand weather patterns across time. Are you going to build into that simulation the individual effects on people of that weather? Like that, that certain weather makes certain people do better and other people make uh, get less better. So there's more. Um, my point in bringing up this example is that you're only going to build into the simulation that which is required for the outcome of the simulation, the telos of a, a simulation. The telos is the why. The telos is the, the purpose of the simulation. Um, and so in, in that kind of simulation on weather, there is no reason whatsoever to build in qualitative descriptors at, uh, on better or worse weather. There's, there's no reason to say a tornado is worse than uh, a wind, like, like a 10 mile an hour wind, right? There's no reason to say like a category five hurricane is qualitatively worse than a category one hurricane. Because in that simulation of the weather, all you're trying to do is see what happens with the weather. And when at the, at the intro of this video, when I was talking about, I, I wasn't talking, I was reading from Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance when he, when he said, okay, you can understand that quality exists by subtracting it from the system. If you subtract quality from the system we call life, then you get something like that weather simulation where whether, let's say, someone suffers or not, it doesn't matter. You, you basically get nihilism is what you get. It just doesn't matter what happens to anyone under any circumstances. My, my whole point in, in saying this is that Quality is at the heart of our human experience. It's at the it, it's the essence of our human experience. In that, the only reason to have quality in a game, the only reason to to care about quality in any simulation, in any system whatsoever, the only reason to care about quality is if you care about the players. That's it. If you're focused on participants who are in interacting and engaging in whatever system there is, then the participants, the conscious entities that are participating in that system, th then quality matters because the conscious participants need to know from quality whether they're doing better or worse. 
whether the game is going well for them or poorly, whether they need to change their strategy in the game or whether their strategy needs to stay the same. Um, so, okay, so I, I think beyond a reasonable doubt, I can say that the, the whole point of quality is for the, the phenomenological experience of the players. And so that's, that's tying back to AI a little bit. And that's the reason that an AI can, cannot experience qualities because they don't have phenomenological experience. Um, there's a lot of people who think we will eventually have AIs that are conscious, that have phenomenological experience. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, we're going to find out. But, I, but that's what I'm saying, that quality is absolutely key to that. That until an AI or any entity can receive quality, I don't think it's conscious. I, I think that's a really, really good measure of it. Um, and quantity, quality is the horizontal phenomenon. Quality is measuring things that are right here, right now, physical world. And quality is that vertical phenomenon that scales all the way up. Uh, in game development terms, uh, I mentioned this on a stream, but I, I think of quality as uh, floats that they, they scale up to infinity. You can have suffering all the way down, like negative infinity, <laughs> and you can have joy, enlightenment, whatever, all the way up. But all those terms make zero sense in a world without quality. All right. Uh, last thing I'm going to say on this is that if the AI gets to the point where it's the ultimate left brain, where the ultimate left brain, the AI, solves every practical problem on the in the world it solves every practical problem so what i mean by practical problem is like every problem that we give it um that is on the outside of the human soul what's going to be left with is the human soul so if if you solve every problem that's a practical problem in someone's life so so here's here's another example of doing that you give someone the genie in the bottle right you, but you say you have unlimited wishes, but the wishes have to be uh, centered on on you, whatever, you know, um, then what happens in that scenario is the person's imagination, like, or, or who they are, the center of their being is revealed. The, the genie in the bottle, the wishes reveal who that person really is. Uh, it's like, because you... you the person becomes known by their loves, you could say, or what they pursue or what they try to get. And in that AI world of the ultimate left brain, it basically is the equivalent of the genie in the bottle. So if money is no longer an issue, if our bodies, if our, if our uh, aging is no longer an issue, etc. So what, what is left? What will we do? And I suspect... I suspect that then the human soul will truly be revealed and, and the essence of what it means to be human. And I also suspect that the AI will not be able to replace that essence. And I have some thoughts on that. I have a lot of thoughts on that, actually, but we'll save that for another day. Thank you. Uh, thank you guys in the comments for, for tolerating me well. I, I think as, as my streams here become more and more abstract and less and less tethered from the actual game development, fewer and fewer people will, uh, will watch them. But that's fine by me, actually. Um, that's somewhat intentional because in order to really create a good game world, you have to think well beyond the... the you, you have to have that vertical scaling in, in thought. And, and the reason is that in order to, to make a great game, well, you kind of get what I'm saying. In order to have a great game, it has to be pointing to the right things in the right way. And in order to get those things that it's going to point to uh, in the right in the right way, we need to incorporate culture, religion, philosophy. All that needs to come into really understanding a great game. And there, there's very few people that I think are interested in those kinds of things. Um, and so, uh, I'm I'm less. I, I would say with these streams, you know, I'm just less I'm just very uninterested in the quantity. So whatever you would say the the shallow is like that is kind of what I'm trying to avoid and I would say the meaning of deep is is both two things it's 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 difficult to reach it's inaccessible because it's so deep uh but then the the, the impact of it is profound across time and and really that that's what I'm that's what I'm trying to that's what I'm trying to do 
And that's why I'm, I'm engaged in this little corner of the internet. And the people already in there know what I'm talking about. And anyone who does not know this little corner of the internet, I would love to get you interested in it. Because if, if you are interested in all the things I'm discussing, if, if, the, you, if you do find this interesting, there is a place, <laughs> or a not a place, a virtual place, uh, that is the, I would say, the healthiest environment for discussing and learning and growing with other fellow, fellow seekers. That's a good way of putting it. Uh, of, of things that are deep. I'll put it that way. Uh, okay, so um, what else did I want to talk about? I kind of wanted to talk about the YouTube algorithm. Um, but first, so talking about deep things. Let me actually play a little bit. This is a good point to play. I had this uh, epiphany. This was uh, a few weeks ago. I had this epiphany that... So landscapes, if, if you're familiar with Unreal Engine, uh, landscapes are inherently, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They're, they're not dynamic. They're static entities, landscapes. And I was thinking to myself, I was like, oh man, like I want, I want the player to be able to move the world up and down, to be able to go under the world. It's that depth to go, to go further down um, or further up for that matter. And because I had that insight, I realized, okay, I need to, I need to fundamentally redesign the, the level. Uh, so instead of being a flat two-dimensional landscape, I'm using instanced static meshes, which I've learned a lot about working with foliage. And I, uh, I made a landscape with these movable blocks. And the idea is that I haven't done this yet, but the player is going to be able to pop those up, pop those down, go under the ground. There's going to be a level underneath. Why would you want to go under the ground? Like, what is the conventional reason in a game that players would want to go under the ground and this kind kind of gets to what i was just talking about with culture i hope this doesn't crash the game i'll just show this really quick but this stuff right here all the prophetic tradition stuff uh in nature that stuff is in your typical game the stuff that's under the ground the reason bilbo goes into the uh, i was just watching the 1977 hobbit with my daughter which i love the 1977 um animated hobbit when i was a kid loved it uh, but the reason the bilbo goes into the tunnel to uh what he's gonna slay the dragon um he's gonna burgle something like what it, what matters if if uh, something gets burgled right but the reason he goes in is because he's meant to go in and not only that he's meant to discover something both about himself like in, in courageous circumstances but also discover that in the broader world which has to be unleashed which is the dragon and, and it has to be unleashed in order for the dragon to finally be slain um and that is the same phenomenological process that i was just describing like this thing right here prophets in the prophetic tradition um that's it you go under the ground to get new treasures to bring into the world the garden here to tend the garden appropriately so anyway so Landscape's going to have these movable uh, instant static meshes up and down. If you move it up, it's going to be able to create a wall, which is kind of cool. You need to be able to create separations uh, between the good and the evil from time to time. And uh, to put it down, then you'll be able to, to go under the world. And maybe there's multiple layers under. So there's that stacking depth. Um, yeah, so the I think I might just end it there there's there's things i've got here that i haven't uh talked about but i guess in summary i think i think the way i want to wrap this up is even if you have zero interest in game development understanding the nature of quality or understanding the nature of art and really thinking about the implications of why art even exists, like why quality even exists. I think, I think it's the key to remembering what makes us human, why life is worth living, what to spend our time on, and what separates us from the machine. And to the extent that the AI is able to edify to the to the extent that the AI is able to organize and assist and be a tool for our humanity for the extension of our humanity whatever our humanity is 
uh, then the AI is, man, that, that just scared me a little bit. <laughs> uh, then the AI is going to be a good thing, you know, it's going to be helpful. But to the extent that the AI becomes a substitute for depth, to the, to the extent that the AI becomes a substitute for the human soul, um, then I think it's going to be a problem. And so I think that's a good place to, to end here. Um, I have a f just a couple more things in quality, and then we are going to end uh, this particular series. And uh, we're actually going to do, I'm going to do one more of these episodes next week, right away. And, uh, and then it has to do with my schedule. I'm going to do, this is going to happen again uh, next, yeah, next Saturday. And then the following Saturday will be a tutorial. And then we're back to the normal every other week uh, schedule. So yeah, thanks for bearing with me. Th this one was, I think, more abstract than any other uh, one I've done thus so far. So we started at the base of the mountain. <laughs> I remember talking about this initially. We started at the base of the mountain and we're kind of slowly, slowly working, meandering our way uh, up the mountain. And we get closer and closer to understanding the nature of the abstraction itself. So, yep, I'll leave it there. Thank you, gentlemen, and talk to you next time.